here at Mohai. Uh, for low to no vision audiences, um, I'm a white woman with red curly hair wearing a flowery black dress and a black cardigan. Um, and I'm just here to give the housekeeping notes, <laughs> which are, most importantly, if you need the restroom, you go back into the cafe and to the left, and there will be two single stall restrooms there. Um, and then also to tell you a little bit more about History Cafe, this is a series. So if you enjoy yourself tonight, you can come back every month on the third Wednesday when we will be doing this um, wonderful series. It's a partnership between Mohai and History Link that's been going for somewhere over a decade. I don't remember exactly how many years. Um, but uh, we're so excited to do this every month. So the schedule of events tonight is there will be an hour presentation with some trivia interspersed and then a 30 minute Q&A. Uh, as far as access needs go, we do ask that if you're going to answer a question or have a question you want to ask, please raise your hand and we will come find you with a microphone. That is so that our captioners and interpreters can hear it, anyone who's hard of hearing, and then also so that it's crystal clear for those joining us at home on the live stream, and so it will sound good in our YouTube recording, because if you like this, you can watch it again on YouTube. <laughs> so as we're getting grounded into the space, I think it's important for us to think about where we are. And here at Mohai, we are on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish people. Historically, Native communities were forcefully removed from the city, and today we honor their continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. We encourage you to visit the websites of local tribes to learn more about the people whose land you are on. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kiku, who's our partner from History Link, and will be introducing our amazing speakers tonight. So, big round of applause. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, my name is Kiku Hughes. Uh, I am a white passing mixed race woman uh, with short brown hair, wearing a red hat and a yellow coat. Um, and I work for History Link, that's historylink.org, um, the online encyclopedia of Washington State history. Um, feel free to visit for more context around some of the things you'll be reading or hearing about today. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers tonight. First, we have Anne Frantilla, who has worked at the Seattle Municipal Archives since 1999. She worked as reference archivist from 1999 to 2016 before becoming city archivist. Prior to SMA, she worked for Burroughs Corporate as corporate archivist and the Bentley Historical Library at the University of Michigan. She believes the archives is full of voices waiting to be heard and is passionate about finding ways to amplify those voices. Also tonight, we'll be hearing from Jeannie Fisher, who is a reference archivist at the Seattle Municipal Archives. She has over 15 years of experience working in libraries and archives and is passionate about helping people find and access the information they need. Um, and, and this program came together because I really wanted to do a program, a history cafe on the history of homelessness in Seattle and how we've addressed the needs of people um, who are without homes in the city over history. Um, but it was really hard to find a really good comprehensive source for that. Um, and what I did find was an incredible series of digital documents in the digital document library at the Seattle Municipal Archives that was put together by Jeannie and Anne um, and that had all these incredible primary source materials. And so I was really excited that they agreed to come here to talk about how this history as unfolds through these primary source materials and what it can teach us about, you know, the history of homelessness and, and what we're dealing with today. So thank you. Uh, without further ado, here's Jeannie and Anne. Thank you for the introduction um, and thank you to History Cafe and Mohai for having us um, and to all of you for coming out. Um, I know weeknights aren't always easy for people. Jeannie and I have attended many presentations here, um, and following people like Sean Scott and David Williams is a little daunting. Um, 
but archivists are always really excited to talk about what's in the archives, and we're no exception. Um, pictured here on the title slide is an image of Hooverville's on the Tide Flats from 1933. Um, I also forgot to say that I'm a white woman with short brown hair, um, wearing a blue sweater. Get my clicker working. There's a view of our stacks in the archives, or part of them. And I just wanted to say a little bit about SMA before we got started. Our mission is to identify, acquire, arrange, describe, preserve, and make accessible records of enduring value created or received by city agencies and elected officials. The archives is open to all. We like to say that you never know what you'll find in the archives, and to some extent that is true. You don't know what you'll find in a folder titled Homelessness Policy and Program Records, for example, or one titled Encampments. But in SMA's case, you do know that the records will address policies relating to homelessness from the city's perspective. You, you know you will be able to learn about the range of opinions regarding homelessness from Seattle residents and the unhoused. In any archives, it's important to know where the records originate, as this gives them context. At SMA, an item could come from a specific department, the office of an elected official, or a resident from a specific neighborhood. Archivists are different than historians. Archivists provide sources for historians to use. And becoming an archivist helped me realize that how people write history, how they write about what happened in the past, can never be objective. The voices that you include to craft your narrative about the past matter. In this presentation, we'll look at a subset of the primary sources available at SMA on homelessness, providing a glimpse of what issues face the city and how city government has addressed them over time. Records in the archives can tell us many things, provide political perspectives at specific points in time, insight in different sides of an issue, and shed light on the decision-making process in local government. Exhibits, which are a form of outreach for us, have taken different forms over the years. One of the early ideas we had for exhibits was a digital document library, or DDL. These provide a brief narrative and an extensive list of digitized documents that students or others can use without having to visit the archives, and can also serve as a jumping off point for more research. DDLs were off, are often topics without as much visual content as other topics. The idea with digital document libraries is to not, not to be comprehensive on a topic, but show people enough so that they know there is more if they want or need it. Documents on the DDL for Hoovervilles were chosen to represent the perspectives of the unhoused and those who wanted to help them, as well as those who found them a nuisance. The first petition in the list begins Quote, we, the rank and file delegation, have been unanimously elected by over 3,000 unemployed workers assembled before City Hall on February 10th, 1931. It is known that there are between 45,000 to 50,000 unemployed workers and their families, and they are suffering from cold and hunger. The masses of the city of Seattle are suffering as a result of the breakdown of the present capitalist system of economy, which has proven itself unable to serve the interests of mankind. The petition ended by requesting $5 million for the immediate relief of the unemployed. No photographs <clears throat> of the event exist at SMA, but the flyer pictured here and the petition submitted to the mayor and city council are in the archives. For more context on the event, you could explore what's available in local newspapers at the Seattle Public Library or check, for other, check at other archives for related materials. It was clear from the, just the small selection of documents on the DDL and Hoovervilles that the unemployment and housing issue was getting worse in the 1930s. The 1935 Health Department annual report stated that, quote, Seattle has been forced to allow the growth of shack towns. They were mostly located along the waterfront and on the filled in tidelands. Language is important, I always feel, and noted is the use of the word of shacks. Several people wrote 
to City Council from Magnolia. One of the letters has stuck with me, dated April 24, 1937, from the North End Progressive Club. The way in which the writer anonymized the people to such an extent that she could envision shooting them to get rid of them out of the way <clears throat> was hard to forget. This brief dip into the records relating to Hooverville's bolstered my knowledge that one of the strengths of SMA records is that they illustrate the attitudes of residents and the needs of citizens. Archives are arranged by the creators of the records, so it's important to, to know the health department was addressing the issue at one point, for example, and that the concerns of residents went to the mayor and city council. We recently started a favorable favorite archival object series, another form of outreach, where we each pick an item or set of items and explore why we are drawn to it. I came across reports from the Mayor's Commission for Improved Employment from 1931 to 1932. Even the wording of the committee is interesting as if they couldn't use the word unemployed. The favorite archival object structure is not designed as much for students to find and use documents, but to engage all public with content in the archives. In this report, the city's actions are featured, although it also illustrates how fast strategies can change depending on who is elected to office. And unsaid in the report is who was turned down for requests for access to the depots, the report describes. Not all requests were fulfilled, sometimes what documents do not exist or what was not reported in a document is just as important as what was included. The photographs of the relief depots from 1931 caught my eye partly because there are so few images on this topic from this time period in the municipal archives. In the years following the 1929 stock market crash, Seattle suffered a high rate of unemployment, like many other parts of the United States, and by 1931, it was at 7%. In response, Mayor Harlan established the Commission for Improved Employment in the fall of 1931 to help the unemployed in Seattle obtain work, as well as food and clothing through a district relief program. The Commission organized relief into five geographic districts and welcomed supplemental relief provided by the Community Fund, the Unemployed Citizen League, Goodwill, and others. The depots began operation in November 1931. The city appropriated $10,000 to purchase food to distribute and many donations were received as well for both food and clothing. The neighborhood depots were in part created to stimulate awareness within neighborhoods of how the unemployed were benefiting from the generosity of those in more fortunate circumstances. A report on the depots was accompanied by photographs to illustrate the work occurring at the depots. I was struck by the way the photographs were meant as outreach in order to help people understand that the unemployed were not unlike themselves, except for the fact they'd lost their jobs. I could see similarities to characterizations of the homeless today. The photographs were taken at a variety of depot locations. At the depot at 12th and Yesler, supplies are loaded to be sent to the district depots. Former Mayor Bertha K. Landis oversaw the women's division of the Commission for Improved Employment. This work included two sewing rooms where old clothes were renewed. This image shows Mrs. C.S. Sapp in the clothing department of Northeast Relief Depot at 1304 East 45th. Other women in the Northeast Depot sort and clean clothing. Shoes were repaired at the Northwest Relief Depot at 5419 Ballard Avenue. The report stated that hundreds of pairs of shoes donated by Ballard citizens are rebuilt each week on donated machinery for distribution to families of more than 700 unemployed. John B. Goff, volunteer manager, and Raymond Peters are pictured. The Rainier Relief Depot at 3805 Edmonds Street is pictured here with women and children receiving shoes and clothing. These men are at the North Central Relief Depot, 3122 Elliott Avenue, receiving a week's provisions for their families. The jug contains milk and the sack on the floor contains potatoes, flour, cans of vegetables and fruit, butter and other supplies. This image at the Georgetown Relief Depot shows people getting their supplies. The boy with the bandage told the photographer he'd just been released from the hospital and that it was his 10th birthday. The relief depots were deemed a success in their first two months, in part because of the community and neighborhood support. A report provided on January 8, 1932, stated there were 15,609 requests for food, of which they were able to fill 9,834, and 3,728 requests for clothing, of which 2,280 were filled. After Mayor Dorr was elected in 1932, a new county welfare board was established and a plan was made to close the city's relief depots. State and federal aid would be coming soon. 
The captions for these photographs provide valuable information on who the individuals were, where the photographs were taken, and what was happening, and show us what the interior of the relief depots looked like. The images illustrate the city working to help residents in need during this period. With the change in the political leaders and evolving state and federal aid, the form of assistance was bound to change, illustrating the difficulty of providing sustained relief to those in need during times of emergencies. I started looking for clues on how the city was moving forward with an increasing number of the unemployed and homeless in the 1930s. I looked in the annual reports of the police, parks, and other departments, but was un unable to locate any reference to shacks or shanties. But I did find this resolution passed by city council in 1938 in the legislative database. Many researchers come to us wanting to look at minutes for city council meetings, but as you can see from this entry, they are not as interesting as you might think. They do not have a lot of context and simply record the decision made at the meeting. Of note that this is a resolution which reflects the intent of council, but would not have carried the weight of law. The resolution stated prohibiting the erection of shanties, shacks, lean-tos, or other similar shelters in the areas zoned as first residence or second residence districts. The areas referenced are defined in the city's first zoning code, passed in 1923 and pictured on the right, complete with annotations and some scotch tape repair. First residence districts permitted single family dwellings, public schools, private schools, churches, parks, libraries, conservatories, and railroad stations, among other uses. Second residence districts per permitted these uses, as well as apartments and boarding houses, hotels, and hospitals. This map came with a report by the Housing Authority in 1941 and the survey they did of shacks along with the recommendations. This document was included in the DDL on Hoovervilles and also became a favorite archival object, which allowed me to do a deeper dive into how the city dealt with its housing and shack issue in 1941. Researching Hoovervilles many years ago, I came across an object that continues to be one of my favorites. It is a map of the number and distribution of shacks dated March 5, 1941. It helps illustrate in a visual way for me the issue of homelessness and underscores the number of years Seattle has been struggling with how to address this issue. The map was part of Comptroller File 169237 from the Housing Authority. The file included a letter to City Council on the shack problem, a report summarizing location and issues, the number of shacks by census number, a report on the physical condition of shacks, including cooking, lighting, and plumbing facilities, as well as race of occupants, and rental value, as well as this map, which caught my attention immediately. The letter from the Housing Authority to City Council emphasized that none of the present occupants of shacks should be forced to vacate, but that all vacant shacks should be demolished. They also suggested that notice be given that no additional shacks could be built. They defined a shack as, quote, a dwelling of more or less temporary character constructed without benefit of formal design or plan of secondhand nondescript building materials and located indiscriminately. The Housing Authority counted a total of 1,687 shacks in the city. A shack elimination committee was named by the City Council Public Safety Committee after the Housing Authority's report was submitted. Committee members included the Commissioner of Health, the Superintendent of Buildings, the Chief of Police, and the Chief of the Fire Department. The committee reported back to council in April 1941 that they had inspected five areas. The west side of Beacon Hill, Louisville, which was between Airport Way, 6th Avenue South, Massachusetts Street, and Holgate, areas along both sides of 6th Avenue South, between Holgate and Dakota, Hooverville and Alaskan Way, and Inner Bay, near the Garbageville. Other groups of shacks, such as along the Duwamish and near Smith Cove, were not included in the study because buildings in those areas had existed for many years and were owned and occupied by fishermen and other part-term workmen who had a small annual income. Some of these areas, including Hooverville, had existed since the early 1930s. On April 1941, a Seattle Times article reported on the burning of shacks at Seattle's Hooverville on the waterfront, describing the port tractor destroying structures and pushing them into a big bonfire. The property was needed for the defense program. A black member of Hooverville, two named Dave Gren, owned a Nickelodeon or jukebox, the reporter wrote, and as the bulldozer continued smashing the shacks, tiny strains of St. Louis blues rang out defiantly. 
The Housing Authority wrote to City Council again on May 9, 1941, expressing concern that the vacating of shacks was going to be accelerated and that services would not be available to shack dwellers who wanted relocation assistance. A Seattle Times article dated June 27, 1941, stated, quote, Even as smoke was clearing away after the burning of 26 shacks near 6th Avenue South and Spokane Street yesterday, city health authorities were planning mass destruction of 40 more dwellings Monday. That burning would take place at 6th Avenue South and Lander. The chief sanitary engineer of the health department was quoted as saying it would be the last wholesale destruction of shacks in the city in the effort to solve the shack sanitation problem. Citizens continued to write to the mayor and city council in 1941 for the removal of individual shacks. By 1942, in October, according to the Commissioner of Health, 1,543 shacks had been destroyed in Seattle with the assistance of the Navy, Coast Guard, and Port of Seattle personnel. For more information, please see SMA's digital document library, Hoovervilles in Seattle. That was my deep dive into the 1930s and the favorite archival objects give me an excuse to go a little deeper than as archivists we would normally be able to go. My colleague Jeannie Fisher took a much wider view on homelessness and created a DDL pointing to records that range from the Great Fire to Nicholsville and beyond. And she'll take over from here. <clears throat> Hello everyone, um, thank you for being here today. Um, so as Anne said, my name is Jeannie Fisher. I'm a reference archivist at the Seattle Municipal Archives. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman with wavy light brown hair, and I'm wearing a blue sweater with a cream cardigan. Um, so my part of tonight's talk will draw from research I did while putting together a digital document library, or DDL, as Anne said, on the topic of homelessness in city records. Um, and that's the, the picture that you see on the slide there. Um, it has brief narrative and includes links to digitized records, um, and you can access it from anywhere. It also includes a full bibliography pointing to additional records you can use for more research. The intention behind this resource was not to create a comprehensive history of homelessness in Seattle. In fact, soon after I started researching for it, I realized that a comprehensive history would be almost impossible for me to do. Partly because, as Anne noted, we're archivists and not historians. But mainly because this is an incredibly complex topic, reaching into issues of poverty, health care, unemployment, addiction, disability, and much more. So rather than provide a comprehensive history, this DDL is meant to be a guide to city records available on the topic. So what kinds of records are available? There's legislation, for example, ordinances and resolutions. There's also records from city departments and elected officials, and petitions and letters submitted to the city by Seattle residents. There's also photographs, moving images, and audio recordings of public hearings and committee meetings. Overall, city records documenting homelessness in Seattle and the issues that have contributed to it are vast and varied, dating from the late 1800s to the present day. So tonight, I'll highlight just a few of them, and hopefully they can give you a sense of the kinds of records that we have in the archives. So the first record I want to share with you dates from just a few years after the city was incorporated in 1869. Pictured on this slide is a copy of Ordinance 32, and this is the city's first so-called vagrancy law, passed on November 14, 1872. It goes into a lot of detail in terms of what defined a so-called vagrant. For example, someone who was able to work but was not working, someone who was loitering or begging for money, someone who took shelter in someone else's barn or shed, or someone who was leading a, quote, idle, immoral, or profligate course of life. What struck me about this ordinance is how broadly the law might be applied, despite all the detail, and how subjective the judgment of guilt might be. For example, if you were unemployed and without shelter, or panhandling in the street, or if the authorities felt that you were idle, dissolute, or immoral, you could be considered a criminal and convicted under this law. The penalty under the law was harsh. The ordinance stipulated that those found guilty of vagrancy were to be fined at least $5 and no more than 100 That was a lot of money in 1872, especially if you had no money. 
If the fine could not be paid, the person would be sentenced to hard labor at the city jail. In the following years, more ordinances were passed to further define what could constitute vagrancy, broadening the situations under which the laws could be applied. All of these ordinances can be searched in the city clerk's offices in the city clerk's office legislative database, um, which is available online. And um, on this image is also a bird's eye view of Seattle dating from 1878, just to give you an idea of what the city looked like around this time. Um, there's a lot of industry on display, lots of ships in Elliott Bay, and you really get the sense of a growing city. The downtown and Pioneer Square area are pretty built up. We have a high resolution scan of this map in our digital collection site. Um, and if you zoom in, you can see things like schools and churches and lodging houses and much more. So this is a picture showing tents lining a street in Pioneer Square in 1889. This is now 20 years since the city was incorporated, but rather than a street lined with buildings, which is what you might expect to see um, after 20 years of a booming city, we see tents. There was a major event that happened in Seattle in 1889 that speaks to why we see tents and not buildings. And I'm wondering if anyone here knows what that was. The Great Seattle Fire of 1889, right. Uh, the Great Seattle Fire broke out on June 6, 1889 and destroyed 100 acres in Seattle's business district and waterfront, displacing thousands of Seattleites overnight. By necessity, the newly homeless quickly occupied hastily constructed tents. And within a month of the fire, over 100 businesses were also operating out of tents, as seen in the picture here. As fall and winter approached, some residents petitioned the city for permission to reinforce their tents against the coming cold and wet weather. Seen here is one such petition, written in September 1889 by Seattle resident James T. Armstrong. He describes himself as an old resident of Seattle, whose property at the corner of 4th and Jackson had been entirely destroyed by the fire. Since that time, he says, quote, your petitioner has been compelled to live in a canvas tent. That as the cold and damp weather is near at hand, he will be so exposed in this tent as to be entirely unable to do any business, and hence unable to earn a living for his family unless allowed by your honorable body to cover and surround the tent aforesaid with corrugated iron. In response to this and other similar petitions, the city agreed that iron roofs could be added to tents for protection during the winter months but iron could not be used to reinforce the walls. The city explained their decision by saying that, quote, to allow this much would, in effect, be to sanction the construction of a permanent building with all its vested rights. Citizens can and ought to be content with a good roof and submit to inconvenience for a little while longer for the sake of, gen of the general safety. These documents are part of SMA's general files collection, which includes some of the earliest materials held in the archives, mostly dating from the late 1800s. All of the general files are individually cataloged, and over half of the collection has been digitized, including these documents, and can be viewed online at our digital collection site. This handwritten report, also from the General Files Collection, was prepared by the city's Fire and Water Committee a couple months later in November 1889. It recommends the city implement a policy calling for all tent permits to be withdrawn and canceled by May 1, 1890, and that all tents be removed by that date. This record and others illustrate how the focus of city officials was on rebuilding Seattle with permanent structures, and within the following year, the city had been nearly completely rebuilt and its population increased by almost 33%. So there's one more document I wanna share from 1889. This petition dates from December of that year and is the earliest complaint I could find in the archives about what we might call today a temporary encampment. The petition was signed by over 20 property owners requesting the removal of so-called shanties or shacks that had been erected near their properties. The petitioners were complaining that the structures were, quote, untidy, unsafe, and caused a threat to their buildings, which forced them to pay increased insurance payments. For these reasons, the petitioners asked the city to have the structures removed. So the area defined in the petition concerns two blocks between Stewart and Pike, and Front, which is today's First Ave, 
and west or western, as highlighted on this Sanborn map from 1888. If you're not familiar with Sanborn maps, they were created for fire insurance purposes. They uh, contain detailed block by block representations of the city. Um, they show things like the outlines of buildings, what kind of materials buildings were made out of, um, for example, whether brick or wood, the type of businesses housed in the buildings, how close the buildings were to each other, um, and so on. And this particular Sanborn map is from the Seattle Public Library's online Sanborn map database, um, which is a fantastic resource and free to anyone with a library card. So besides showing the location described in the petition, what I think is also interesting about this map is the note along the left side, um, just to the west of where the highlighted blocks are. The writing characterized the area as having, quote, steep and uneven ground covered with squatters shanties. I couldn't find a reply to this pet petition, so I don't know what, if anything, was done by the city in response. Since at least the 1890s, one way the city assisted unsheltered residents was by providing charitable organizations free access to the municipal water supply. Organizations that were regularly granted free water included hospitals, shelters, orphanages, and others. This is an example of a petition sent to the city asking for free water. It dates from May 1894 and is from the Seattle City Mission, which was located at 604 Commercial Street. And today, Commercial Street is First Ave, so this is basically right in the middle of Pioneer Square. The mission describes itself as providing meals for the, quote, unemployed and destitute. The petition notes that during the previous winter, the mission had provided over 20,000 meals and shelter spaces, which I thought was interesting as it speaks to the level of need at this time. Since the mission relied on donations to provide its services, it was asking the city to forgive their water bill and provide free water. Most petitions asking for free water, like this one, appear to have been granted by the city. However, in September 1896, this letter from the Committee on Fire and Water to the Council President noted that the city was receiving a high number of petitions for free water and recommended that they be denied from that point forward. The reason given was that according to state law, it was technically the county's responsibility and not the city's to provide support for, quote, indigent persons. Although a resolution was soon passed declaring that all future petitions for free water would be referred to the county, by at least 1898, the city seems to have changed course and it was once again granting the petitions, at least some of them. A search in the city clerk's legislative database brings up over 200 petitions from both organizations and individuals asking for free water based on need continuing into the 1960s. The map seen here is from 1908. It's a detailed view of a portion of Pioneer Square where City Hall and the King County Courthouse are today. The long dividing line kind of in the middle of the map is Yesler Way which was previously called Mill Street and is colloquially known as Skid Road. The term Skid Road has its origins in the 1850s when lumber was skidded down from First Hill along Yesler Way to lumber mills on the waterfront. Over the years, it's also become an area synonymous with poverty and homelessness in Seattle. This petition is from May 1907. It was sent to the city from residents along Yesler Way. The petitioners were complaining about a group of shacks that had been truck constructed on a triangle-shaped parcel of land between 3rd, Yesler, and Jefferson, which is now highlighted on the map. Today, this area is Prefontaine Place, which is located across the street from City Hall Park, which is next to the King County Courthouse. The petition is accompanied by a letter that echoes some of the sentiments of the 1889 petition we just saw, calling the shacks unsightly and a nuisance and requesting that the city remove them. In addition to complaints like this, there were also other letters sent to the city during this time that present a different point of view, including some that protested the criminalization of the unemployed and unsheltered who were often arrested and jailed under vagrancy laws. Some letters asked for the city's support with personal efforts to provide assistance to those in need. For example, this handwritten letter was received by the city in January 1908, sent by J.H. Johnson, owner of the Palace Restaurant, 
located at 160 Washington Street near Occidental in Washington, pretty much right in the middle of the Skid Road District. He writes that he has been providing free coffee and rolls to unemployed men in the area. It reads in part, the number of men in line has assumed such proportions that it is now beyond my financial capacity to meet the number. Over 150 men were in line this morning. Through private donation, I have been helped, but it will be impossible for me to care for all those who are now seeking aid if some assistance to me is not rendered. The letter was placed on file and I wasn't able to find any documentation of city assistance. I did, however, find a Seattle PI article from December 1907 reporting that the Palace Restaurant was providing free Christmas meals to quote 500 homeless men. And a Seattle Times article the following year reported that the Palace Restaurant had partnered with the Salvation Army to provide 400 Christmas dinners to quote unemployed and homeless men. So apparently he was able to get some support from other avenues. In 1911, City Council considered establishing a municipal lodging house to provide temporary housing for men without shelter. A report to council submitted by the local charity organization society gave details on how such a facility could be set up and run. It was envisioned as part of a social program that would work closely with the City Employment Bureau with the goal of finding jobs for the men and included the establishment of a quote farm colony to which residents of the lodging house would be sent if they could not find a job in three or so days. The report also recommended the enforcement of vagrancy laws as well as returning non-residents to their families and other cities. An ordinance for the lodging house was drafted and this is the cover of the bill here but the bill was never signed into law. One thing I found especially interesting about the proposed legislation are two pages of statistics attached to the bill, seen here, showing the demographics of men helped by the Charity Organization Society over the course of a month and a half. These details give a rare view of Seattle's unsheltered population during this time, with information including age, time in town, and nationality. There's also data on marital status, physical condition, and the number of meals given by the society during the month of December. A quote cause of application is also noted for some with the reasons given including unemployment, sickness, and old age. There's also a penciled note at the bottom mentioning that the lifeboat mission had provided over 3,000 free meals during the past 20 days and had an average of 180 homeless men sleeping on their floor every night. So this is another record that stood out for me. Um, it's a letter sent to city council from Seattle Police Chief Austin Griffiths in, on November 10th, 1914. In it, he cites the high level of unemployment in the city and explains that the city jail was serving as a kind of default shelter for people who did not have a place to stay the night. He mentions that many unemployed men were now stranded in the Skid Road area and added, it is not humane, neither is it practical to attempt to drive these unemployed persons out of Seattle. He also stresses that the number of people needing shelter and food, quote, is not a police problem, but is a social problem. He went on to say that arresting everyone who was unemployed and on the streets, quote, does more harm than good to the misfortune of being without work is often added the stigma of being treated as a vagrant or a criminal. What also stood out to me in the letter is the distinction he makes between the quote, worthy poor and those whom he defined as quote, vagrants, which drove home to me again how subjective, how subjective the application of the vagrancy laws could be. He closes the letter, oh, I'm sorry, I missed advancing that. <laughs> He closes the letter um, suggesting that the city and county coordinate efforts to provide employment to those needing it. And later that month, city council passed ordinance 33988 providing for the quote, relief and care of the unemployed of Seattle to take effect immediately. In addition to correspondence and legislation, City records related to homelessness can also be found in surveys, studies, and reports from city departments. 
These photos are from a 1915 Department of Health and Sanitation annual report. The report states that during 1915, sanitation workers had burned or razed 395 condemned buildings deemed insanitary and unsafe for habitation, many of which were described as semi-permanent, quote, unsightly shacks built on tide flats by, quote, squatters with salvaged pieces of lumber and boxes. A lack of sewers and sanitary facilities in the area was cited as the main reason why the improvised structures were deemed a health hazard. And the report describes plans to install privies throughout the district to prevent the spread of disease. The narrative gives a lot of detail and, points of, and paints a vivid picture of what conditions were like in the area. But what I also thought was really interesting is that the report includes photos. Seen here are a few examples. Not only do they show the exterior of the structures described, but one of the pictures also gives us an example of an interior. So I'm curious how many people here know that underneath the pergola in Pioneer Square is a restroom, an old restroom? Okay, a few people. Um, so the Pioneer Square Comfort Station, which is what public restrooms were called back then, um, opened in 1909. These four images are from the 1910 Parks Department Annual Report. Um, one shows the men's room, one shows the women's room, one shows the outside entrance under the pergola, and one shows the floor plan illustrating how it was laid out. Both the 1909 and 1910 Annual Reports dedicate several pages to the comfort station, going into a lot of detail about the design and the materials used including marble stall dividers, porcelain sinks and urinals, nickel-plated brass fixtures, and much more. The report states that the press and many members of the public were initially opposed to the comfort station. But since opening, the reception had been universally positive, and it was popular. According to the report, 8,000 people, on average, used it on a daily basis, and as many as 15,000 on Sundays when the saloons were closed. The 1910 report calls it, quote, the largest and most elaborate underground comfort station in the United States, and also includes an excerpt from a 1910 Pacific Builder and Engineer article, which says, the man of travels will find nowhere in the Eastern Hemisphere a subsurface public comfort station equal in character to that which has been recently completed in the downtown district of Seattle. During the Depression, the comfort station became even more essential as it served as a key sanitary facility for residents of the large Hooverville encampment no nearby on the Tide Flats, as well as for members of the Skid Road community. On December 31st, 1942, the comfort station was closed by the city after it had fallen into disrepair. The city received several letters in protest asking for it to be repaired rather than closed citing a lack of public toilets and washing facilities in the area. The letter seen here is from a store located in Pioneer Square, asking to go on record protesting the closure, stating, quote, the class of people who use these, those conveniences are here in the city and it is up to the city to take care of them. We cannot run them out of town because they have no place to go. This letter is sent by the King County OAPU which I think is the old age pension union, referred to the closing as a quote, grave situation. And also received was a petition protesting the closure signed by approximately 500 people. And seen here are just a few pages of the signatures. The petition cites the importance of the facility to the people in the area who, in the absence of another option, would be driven into the nearby taverns and bars for relief. So despite these protests and others, the comfort station remained closed for several years. In 1949, the Public Safety Committee requested that the City Planning Commission conduct a survey of sanitary facilities in Pioneer Square to evaluate the present need and determine if reopening the comfort station would help. The archives has a copy of the resulting study, the cover of which is seen here which includes demographic statistics and a complete inventory of available facilities. The study determined that there were 2,500 residents and approximately 1,500, quote, homeless 
and unemployable men living within the district. And it concluded that the rehabilitation of the comfort station would not be enough to solve the problem. The report recommended that a sanitary and social center be established nearby and suggested three possible buildings that could be adapted to fit the need. One of them was the Lutheran Compass Mission located in Pioneer Square. In February 1952, the Lutheran Compass Mission sent this letter to City Council proposing to install a sanitary social center for public use in the basement of their building at 77 Washington Street. The following month, the city entered into a contract with the mission to quote, establish and maintain a recreational center for homeless men in the Skid Road area with toilets, showers, and laundry facilities. The city continued supporting the mission for this purpose into the next several decades. And there's the ordinance, okay. So now we're gonna jump ahead a few years to Seattle's Model Cities program. Um, in the late 1960s through the 1970s. Model Cities projects included several that worked to address homelessness and related issues. Um, the Central District, the International District, and Pioneer Square, including the Skid Road area, were designated Model City neighborhoods and targeted to receive services. Projects initiated and supported by Model Cities included drug and addiction treatment services, outreach programs for at-risk youth, healthcare services for low income and transient populations, and food, shelter, and referral services for the Skid Road community. The program also helped to begin a neighborhood cleanup program in 1972, which by the, the mid-1980s was run by the Seattle Conservation Corps, or the SCC. The SCC still exists today as a parks department program and continues to provide training, work experience, and income to people experiencing homelessness. The archives has a large number of model city records documenting these projects, including project proposals, planning, administration, evaluations, and more. So one of the two images on this slide is the logo for model cities, um, which is roughly in the shape of a bird and would sometimes include the phrase, make it fly. The other image is a color photo taken in June 1971, showing a model city's cleanup project in progress. So the early 1970s, um, the U.S. was headed towards a recession, and locally Seattle had the highest national employment rate since the Great Depression. Many of the records I found relating specifically to homelessness during this time were focused on the Skid Road area. For example, in December 1971, the city was considering authorizing funds to support a Skid Road food and shelter program to help residents during the winter months. This is a letter from the First Avenue Service Center sent to City Council in support of this program. I think what stood out for me initially when I found this letter was the sense of urgency expressed in it. It calls on the city to, quote, act immediately to relieve the acute housing needs affecting the inhabitants of the Skid Road area and says that human beings by the hundreds are forced to sleep outdoors in weather severely detrimental to human survival. Days later, the city passed ordinance 100582, seen here, allocating model city funds to support the food and shelter program and authorizing an agreement with the Skid Road Community Council to manage it. The Skid Road Community Council was a nonprofit organization advo which advocated and supported the district's residents. The two color photos on the slide date from the 1970s. The top photo shows a pawn shop in Pioneer Square and the bottom photo shows the intersection of 3rd and Jackson with King Street in the background. Oops. So I was curious if there were other reasons um, besides the recession for the low income housing shortage and um, in the Pioneer Square Skid Road area at this time and found some clues in this report published by the Skid Road Community Council in 1972. While acknowledging that the housing problem was, quote, diverse and intricate, the report pointed to the strict enforcement of fire and building codes as a key reason why housing availability had plummeted in the area. When faced with violations, owners of residency hotels, which were a key source for low-income housing, 
had the option of making repairs or closing. According to the report, many landlords were choosing to close rather than invest in costly repairs, leaving low-income residents with few options in the area. The other thing I found interesting about this report is that it includes statistical data on services available at this time, accompanied by the names of related service agencies. For example, it outlines shelter options, employment numbers, free food and meals options, and health services available. So this report is included in SMA's published documents collection, which is a great resource for finding um, reports on similar projects and services over time. So this report on downtown housing for the, from the, for the low income was produced in May 1986 and is also from the published documents collection. Although this is 14 years after the report we just saw, it describes the same issues that by this time, according to the report, had reached a, quote, crisis situation. It also cites code enforcement as responsible for the closing of residency hotels and other single room occupancy or SRO housing. In addition, the report states that the renovation of some SRO housing into studios and one bedroom units had resulted in few, fewer units available overall and at higher, less affordable rates, meaning that, quote, low income residents are being displaced to make room for middle income residents. While acknowledging that the issue of homelessness is complex, the report points to this loss of housing, as well as recent sharp decreases in federal and state funding as the key contributing factors to the crisis. Also in 1986, a bond measure was passed by Seattle voters, authorizing a levy to provide housing for low-income households and establishing city housing development programs. The housing levy remains a key source of funding for affordable housing in Seattle. And over the past several decades, Seattle residents have consistently supported this measure, with the most recent housing levy passing just last year in November 2023. In addition to legislation, the archives has records related to the levy in council member records, mayoral records, departmental records, and more. In 1989, the city adopted a homeless priority agenda prepared by the Human Services Strategic Planning Office. The seven-page agenda defined the dynamics of homelessness in Seattle and was intended to be used as a guide for implementing city efforts. The agenda identified recent trends such as an increase in unsheltered families and a growing number of, quote, homeless youth. It emphasized that coordinating city efforts with other current and potential partners was essential and listed priorities for action, which included expanding prevention and stabilization strategies, adding transitional and emergency services, increasing housing options, and improving coordination across city departments and with other agencies working in response to the need. During the 1980s and 90s, ordinances to redefine and increase the penalties for things like loitering, camping, and panhandling were passed by city council. For example, in 1985, the city passed an ordinance redefining menacing behavior and disorderly conduct, allowing the police to determine when panhandling was aggressive enough to constitute harassment and intervene. The legislative history of this ordinance can be researched using several different collections in the archives. For example, background materials and supporting documents filed with the city clerk's office include letters from residents both supporting and opposing the law. The archives also has audio recordings of public comment from hearings and council committee meetings. This may not sound like the most exciting listening, but these recordings are incredible resources that not only document the legislative process, they also include the voices of everyday Seattleites who may not be documented anywhere else. For example, a public hearing held to discuss an earlier version of this ordinance on May 30th, 1985, includes over two and a half hours of testimony from people speaking both in favor of the law and against it. As I listened to the recording, it struck me that several of the comments sounded like they could have been made today. This hearing, as well as many others, have been digitized and are available to listen to and download from our digital collections site. 
1993 and 94, a series of so-called civility laws was passed, were passed. Over, one of the laws allowed for the closing of spaces under bridges and viaducts when necessary to, quote, preserve the public peace. Also passed were ordinances defining, quote, aggressive begging and making public urination, defecation, and liquor consumption criminal acts. Another law banned sitting or lying on the sidewalk in the downtown area from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. This law was challenged in court, but the State Court of Appeals and the Ninth U.S. Circus Circuit Court of Appeals ultimately ruled that the ordinance did not violate constitutional rights. And the Supreme Court, the State Supreme Court, declined to take up the case, allowing the law to stand. The archives has a collection documenting the enactment of these ordinances, including departmental correspondence and memos, letters from residents both in favor and in opposition to the laws, and records relating to the litigation. The black and white photo seen here is from the collection and shows an example of what was considered loitering on the sidewalk in the University District circa 1993. This impact report from 1999 evaluates progress made by the city towards goals outlined in its consolidated plan for housing and community development, which was developed under guidelines established by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. According to the report, the city spent over 100 million that year on initiatives to combat homelessness. Although it highlights numerous successes, such as increased shelter capacity and permanent housing options, it also acknowledges that, quote, Despite a booming economy, there is an increasing number of homeless persons in Seattle. So in addition to textual records and photographs, the archives also has moving images related to homelessness. I wanna play just a short clip from a documentary produced by the Seattle Channel in 2001 called Just Like Noah. The documentary follows Noah who is struggling with homelessness in Seattle while waiting for a kidney transplant. It shows him going through dialysis, spending nights sleeping on the bus, navigating the red tape of trying to secure housing, and asking for assistance from passerbys in front of the dicks in Queen Anne, as we'll see in the clip. I mean, it gets, I get extremely lonely here sometimes because I'm here by myself. Hello, ma'am. How are you tonight? Wonderful, wonderful. You can be on top one, one day and be on the bottom the next. Oh, <laughs> All right. Thank thanks a lot, man. Yeah, I'll eat this later. <laughs> I said, there's times that I've had uh, 13, 14, 15 hamburgers and nine order fries, six Cokes at the end of the night and still no place to stay. And not that I'm not grateful, because I am. I am grateful. I am grateful. In 2005, a new regional initiative was launched. The Committee to End Homelessness in King County, or CEH, was spearheaded by King County and led by a broad coalition of stakeholders, including the City of Seattle and other local governments, housing authorities, social services providers, businesses, faith-based faith groups, and people who are currently experiencing or who had experienced homelessness. The effort aimed to create 9,500 housing units while building and realigning systems to help people access and retain permanent housing. When 2015 arrived, the CEH had been rebranded as All Home and released a report evaluating the program's efforts and results. It stated that the plan had succeeded in ending homelessness for nearly 40,000 people However, the report also acknowledged that nearly 10,000 people were currently experiencing homelessness in King County, and the numbers were continuing to grow. Both of these reports are cataloged in SMA's published documents collection. They've both been digitized and can be viewed and downloaded from our digital collections site. In 2008, the first Nicholsville encampment was established along West Marginal Way. The name harkened back to the Hoovervilles of the Great Depression, with residents naming it for Mayor Greg Nichols in response and in protest to continued encampment sweeps and the lack of available shelter space in the city. This photo is from a visit to Nicholsville by council members Sally Bagshaw, Nick Licata, and Tom Rasmussen in July 2011. 
The visit took place during a Housing, Human Services, Health and Culture Committee uh, meeting on July 7th. Since this was an official uh, committee meeting, it was recorded and the audio is cataloged in the archives. The recording includes a tour of Nicholsville given to the council members by residents who lived there. So I wanna play a very short clip from the audio um, and it relates directly to the photo seen here. It features a resident of the camp named Rita who was described as one of Nicholsville's donation coordinators. One of our donation coordinators, she's one of them, um, Rita. Hi. Hi, Rita. Hi. My name is Rita Bill. Hey, Rita. My husband is Boris is Mike. Uh, we, like he said, we've been here since uh, February 4th. I am a donation coordinator. This is our donation tent, which is close to the wall. Uh, we get clothes, toys, books, games, hygiene, personal things. Uh, as campers need it, they'll find one of three to, you know, and ask for what they need. We'll get it for them on toothbrushes, shampoos, uh, women hygiene things. You know, if they need some clean clothes, something that maybe go find a job with, you know, we'll bring it out, let them go through it, you know, and get what they need out of it. So the full audio is over an hour long and can be listened at um, at our digital collection site. In November of 2015, Mayor Ed Murray issued a proclamation declaring a civil emergency for homelessness, which is seen here. These photos were taken the same year and are cataloged with Mayor Murray's staff records. They're part of a series of several black and white photographs showing encampments near I-5. When I see them, I can't help but think of the photos from the 1915 Health Department annual report, as well as, as, well as the Hooverville photos that Ann shared earlier. So every one of the records we've highlighted here tonight has a layered, complex story that is far more complicated and involved than our brief remarks can represent. I certainly know as I researched this topic and prepared for this talk, I had far more questions than I had answers. If this also brings up questions for you or if you're interested in this topic or any of the records we've described, there are materials in the archives that can help you dig more. This is our website. Uh, seattle.gov slash city archives um, and there you'll find links to our online databases as well as a number of online research guides including the Hooverville and homelessness guides that we've talked about tonight and much more. The archives is located on the third floor at City Hall. This is a picture of our research room. Uh, we're happy to pull any records that you're interested in. Um, we can set up a time for you to visit. And if you have any questions about the collections or if you'd like any help navigating our databases, we're always happy to help with that. Um, our email address is archives at seattle.gov. So thank you very much. All right, if you have any questions, raise your hand and we will bring a microphone to you. You can take a moment to let all of that sit in before you ask them though, because that was, that was amazing. Thank you so much. But as that percolates, um, we are here to help capture your questions. Hi, thank you so much. I have a question um, about, especially in the early period, if you ever came across any notion of squatters rights or if the if they were organizing to try to to try to leverage get some kind of leverage against the city and then secondly um, you had mentioned the Hoovervilles and Nickelvilles but I'm wondering if there if you came across uh, notice of any other large encampments that had popped up during that time and what kind of the geograph if that told if that told you anything about the geographic spread and the migration of, of the homeless community in Seattle. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think Anne can probably answer part of this too. Um, yeah, I, I think d definitely over time um, there were encampments. I mean, I found records of it definitely in the Skid Road area, um, but also I know there was a Hooverville up uh, or by Inner Bay as well. Um, uh, the majority of the encampments or the so-called shack towns that I found evidence of were mostly in the Thai Plats. 
also in, along the Duwamish River, um, and I think the Beacon Hill area as well is what I came across. Um, in terms of squatters' rights, I didn't, I didn't come across anything in the city records relating to that, um, which isn't to say it's not there, uh, but that's not anything that I that I was able to find. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you mean outside of the 30s, because I know in the 30s, um, the Seattle Public Library has. There's a document written by the mayor of Hooverville. I mean, they were pretty organized, um, which I don't think was that unusual maybe for Hoovervilles. Um, but there, there's some interesting documentation on that. Um, but I don't, yeah, I'm not sure I've seen any early organization of, um, of squatters or, you know, people living in shanties early on. Doesn't mean it, you know, we just have sort of what's in the city record, so it doesn't mean it didn't exist. But um, yeah, and geographic, I, I was thinking you could do kind of a cool comparison between early and later, because um, I know that, that one map from the 30s, and then Jeannie found that cool thing in the Sanborn maps where they referenced um, squatters. So um, yeah, I, I noticed in the 30s some of the, the shacks tended to be near dumps, you know, people, because people would like troll for food and different things. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if that answers all of your question. Hi, thank thanks so much again for that. It was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering how difficult you find it to um, to find records that are outside of the city. So, so you mentioned a lot of private. Um, like uh, organizations that were, were providing some of these services to people. Um, how difficult is it to get record of the services being provided, um, not by the government, but by private uh, entities? And um, do you find, uh, you know, a lot of the story of was pushed into, onto these private entities more so than the government itself, if that makes sense. <laughs> Jeannie's probably looked more into what's available on other organizations. I mean, I, you know, national organizations like the Salvation Army maybe have records. You know, I don't know about Bread for Life and some of the other ones. Um, I mean, the best we can do is sort of the reports. They're doing sometimes. I love that letter Jeannie featured from the guy providing roles to the, the guys in Pioneer Square and you know documenting how much he served and stuff. So that's that's kind of a one off. Did you have anything to add? Yeah. The only thing I might add to that is a really great resource. It's not a resource necessarily for the records of the petitioning or sending a letter, we would have evidence of that.
$1 million that came from the city of Seattle in 1931 for the the meals and the clothing and the the food um, during during that high unemployment period. Um, how was that paid for, or is there any way to find more about that in the, the archives? They were, I won't be able to tell you, but I know there is records about it because they were arguing about where they were, they wanted to borrow money f that was supposed to be used for one of the bridges at one point. I mean, it was a point of contention, and I think coming up with the money was maybe one reason why the new mayor decided to, like, not do that program anymore. So there is correspondence on it. I don't remember everything I read on it, but it's there. Throughout the pre presentation, you refer to a lot about men in the shanties. Um, do, you, do you come a lot uh, across a lot of, or any records that talks about actual families, like ch how many children were in these shanty towns or, or families, or was it primarily men? Jeannie's probably looked at more reports than I have on this, but I, a lot of the reports do detail, um, you know, the ones that have nationality and male and female, they will say if there's children. Um, but I think the in the 1930s they were predominantly men. Um, yeah, I, um, I had the same question. I was running because it, it, I kept running across that as well. And the most I saw were um, uh, orphanages would have children um, who were given up by their families or perhaps didn't have parents. Um, and I really only saw women and children referred to in shelters in later years. So I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure I had the same question. Don't know who was next. Thank you for the presentation. I was curious about the archives mandate because I guess it struck me a little that there's no court records or like police records in the archive. We have some municipal court records going way back. They're not super interesting. They, they sort of, you know, this person appeared for this offense and they were fined this much. Um, um, we have police department annual reports. We don't have a lot else from the police department at this time. Um, and we don't have other court records. I mean, if you wanted, you know, King County court records, you'd have to go to King County. So it's a jurisdiction issue. Um, so was that your two questions? Police and court records? Was there another type of record? Yeah. And I just imagine that your mandate doesn't, you can't go into the municipal court and just pull court files into the municipal archives, I imagine? Right. We, we also um, can't go to departments and say, we're taking your records. Um, the, the Municipal Archives was established for a permanent retention of city records. So the, it is mandated as much as it can be. Um, that's where records reside, so. I think someone here had their oh. hand up for a while, sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Allison Isinger and I'm the director of the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness and I really appreciated both parts of your presentations. Um, I apologize, I was a little bit late so I missed some of it but this is perhaps a good follow on to the question that was just asked. Um, we have in our possession at the Coalition on Homelessness probably some very interesting materials that I suspect belong in your municipal archives. Um, so I'm interested to know what your policies and protocols are for accepting documents that continue to flesh this out. I'll also just note that as a, a history student at the University of Washington, in addition to consulting the uh, municipal archives, which were much harder to get a hold of <laughs> then than, than they clearly are now, um, the special collections of the Pacific Northwest holdings at the University of Washington have 
remarkable um, materials on this topic. But what can we um, contribute to your archives that is within your mandate and uh, would tell a fuller story? Um, just a note about the University of Washington. They do, they collect personal records and business records and a huge wide range of records. So they have amazing photos of the Great Fire, for example, and um, just lots of cool stuff there. Um, we can, th our mandate is to accept records created by or for the city. So I don't, I'm, I'd have to, I'm not sure what your agency was called. If it's a county agency, I would refer no. you to the county, but if it's a city one, we would certainly. No, we're an, we're an independent entity, but I guess to be explicit, um, you know, certainly in the 17 years that I've been involved in this, much work is in what we call the gray literature. So emails, no doubt, tons of text messages, mm -hmm. whether they've been deleted or not is another question. Um, but, you know, a lot of material that is relevant to discussion around these topics and actually con decision making that it sounds like you may not have access to. Um, one very pertinent pertinent example is a memo that was written internal to the Human Services Department um, by the deputy director at the time, Al Poole, that precluded the then mayor from taking certain actions against people experiencing homelessness. And I think unless your archives have specifically been given that memo, um, it will be missing, but it's a very important document. Uh, and I have it and I want to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk later about the best place. I mean, definitely the records should be saved. I mean, no doubt about it. Um, it's just for finding the best place for them. So happy to talk later. I actually just wanted to slightly add to uh, on one question that someone had asked earlier that among other archives that are around that can be germane, uh, besides the online stuff at Seattle Public Library of the Times and PI, um, things like the Town Crier and the Argus and all of that are all in the library collections, most of them digitized but not very well indexed. And they're often very useful on that. Um, I guess that, that's probably about what, yeah, I won't add more. I mean, the state also, I can't remember the division at the state, that ha they have an amazing number of, of newspapers digitized also. Real quick question. Ah, this is a follow-up. Um, is there any relationship, if I went to your archives, would I be able to access other, like the special collections at the UW, or if I were at the labor archives at the UW, would they be able to help me access yours, or are they, would they be totally different, or the town crier, or is each one a separate entity that the information is not cross-referenced, or? You wouldn't be able to access, I mean, obviously they're different institutions, so you'd have to go different places to access them. There are some platforms like the Northwest Digital Archives where finding aids are all together for many institutions, so you can search across different institutions for things. Um, did you have a question? No? Okay. Oh, sorry. Hey there, um, I'll ask a question not about the archives logistics. Um, I found it fascinating looking at the Pioneer Square Comfort Station and comparing it to what our comfort stations are now, which are on like a 46 year replacement schedule and they're stainless steel pits, uh, isolated. I was curious kind of looking through from 1910 to now in city council you know, meetings, minutes, uh, I think they're now uh, organized through the park commission um, did you see any sort of shift when it became public bathrooms instead of being for a public good, such as these kind of large scale comfort stations, to now serving more of like a recreational, uh, I'm not sure to say it, accessory use to a park? I was just curious if how that kind of segue lo looked like in the last hundred years of you know what is essentially a public need. 
Jeannie probably Jeannie probably has more to say on that. I, I do know that at one point there was an argument about having them at Westlake. They wanted public, you know, early on public restrooms there. Um, I have a suspicion it had to do with the volume of people, but. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't really come across that. Um, I did come across other files, though, relating to the Pioneer Square Comfort Station, where they considered opening it back up a couple different times. Um, I, I think one was, I want to say, in the 70s, perhaps, and then one in the 90s. And the file that we have on um, from the 90s includes photos, and they're pretty fascinating. Um, it's really uh, in rough shape, but um, but it was just really interesting to see uh, what it looks like. It probably still looks like today. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm just very curious um, on your perspective as archivists about what aspects of the experience of homelessness are more likely to be archived versus like not archived? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on, you know, as Anne was saying earlier, we, we, we hold city records. So it sort of depends on what records come to the archives from city departments, from elected officials. So if there's, for example, legislation being considered um, and there's research done around that legislation, those records would come to us. And so also, as we were pointing out, letters from constituents. So, um, and that might be paper letters, it might be email. We also archive email. Um, then that would, so it, it sort of depends on who is communicating with the city and what city officials are considering, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? It, it has to be a big enough issue that the city wants to address, I guess, in order for it to appear in city records. Um, so, you know, other, there might be community groups, you know, that are documented at the University of Washington, for example, that would have different kind of information. Hello, thank you. I just um, was wondering, I know I've done a lot of research on projects of my own uh, throughout time, <laughs> and there always seems to be something that sticks out that is interesting and that maybe I want to look further into, um, but it doesn't quite fit the project. I was wondering if there was anything that either of you wanted to speak on that you found in your research um, that just didn't quite fit in that you found interesting. I mean, that's the problem with being an archivist is that you can't go down all these rabbit holes all the time. <laughs> um, and that's if we can kind of keep that favorite archival object contained and not make it into these huge, that's sort of the fun in it because we get to do that. Um, I mean, there's probably a million things. I mean, for me overall on this topic, the one thing that strikes me is how persistent it is and we just can't seem, no matter how much money we spend, we can't seem to solve it. So. Um, that's kind of the, that's, you know, big picture, you know, maybe looking at what Matthew Desmond's book on poverty has to say, you know, just kind of looking, p picking out the themes at a local level and seeing how they kind of play in. Jeannie took the big view, though, so she probably has a million rabbit holes she wants to go down. <laughs> I do. I think that's one of the hardest things about research is staying focused on your topic because it's just there's so many different places you can go. Um, and like I said, I think every single one of those records can be researched more thoroughly. And that was really hard for me to just stop. Um, but um, so, you know, I, I'm really fascinated by, um, like the audio recordings I think are, are really, the, the voices that, you, that are behind all of these records. So listening to the, the audio recordings of the meetings, like I said, it sounds maybe like not the most interesting listening, but especially the public comments at public hearings and these issues that people feel so passionately about. Um, it's very, very um, interesting and, uh, and really I, I just a, a wonderful um, archive of that. Um, and then the letters that people would send in, send into the city. I wanted to go down so many different rabbit holes with those. So more than I can say. 
Yes, thanks um, for your presentations. And um, actually, there was a history cafe, I would say, around, I don't know, 2018 that I attended about houselessness. And um, it, it really, y'all touched on some of the themes throughout your archival dives. Um, one of the ones that I remember standing out to me was the societal perception shift around um, essentially migrant worker encampments, one of which I believe they mentioned at the old uh, history cafe that was actually here um, when there was a lot of production for a wartime. Um, and so how those shifts occurred, switching from kind of the normal being these temporary housing areas that supported um, industry, more or less, mm -hmm. into the concept of permanent houselessness. Um, and then the other was, uh, they touched on the topic of zoning and the different uses of zoning, specifically in the international district um, that left many of the upper floors of those buildings unoccupied even when there was housing, housing shortages. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if y'all have anything to add on those topics. No, I think that's completely fascinating. I, I wasn't aware of, of some of that. So I'm just glad to know about it and I'm curious to know more. I think Jeannie touched on the when the building codes came into existence um, and the fire codes. I think that's that was I mean, I found that super interesting and that had a really big impact on on sort of the availability of housing. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, you can be the last question. In your research, you looked over a really long period and got a sense for all the different parts of the city that have had to deal with homelessness. And, and as you mentioned at the beginning, homelessness can be thought of as a crime issue, a mental health issue, a housing issue, an employment issue. I'm curious if you noticed any trends over that long stretch of which parts of the city government have thought most productively or most consistently about the issue? Or has it just, and in many cases, it can be a political football that's shoved between all the different departments because no one can sort out what to do. I'll let Jeannie comment too. It, it, did, it did seem, I was noticing that it did kind of seem to get passed around. And I know in the Hoovervilles, when they wanted to burn them down, um, none of the agencies that ended up doing the burning were city ones because the, the fire department said they were too busy, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. So, um, but yeah, you'll see human services, you'll, you know, the health department, different, different agencies are involved. So, um, and now I think there's a new, completely new agency they've created to deal with it. So, um, I don't know if Jeannie has other comments. It does seem to, they keep trying to find a new solution that will work better and maybe this department will do it better. Yeah, I don't really have much to add except just that, um, you know, it was pretty clear doing the research and even beforehand, and my takeaway is just how, compl how complex it is um, and um, how difficult it is. So I don't, I don't have really too much insight into it, but, um, but there's uh, a lot of information, I think, in the records. Um, there's a lot of patterns that you probably saw tonight and we all see. So um, yeah, it just, it's just, it's an incredibly complex topic. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to our speakers, <laughs> Anne and Jeannie.